Assalamu alaikum Julie dear students I am Anwar Hussain and I teach computer science at the Government High Secondary School Shargol Today I am here before you with a lesson on computer fundamentals This class is intended for students of class 11th as per the syllabus prescribed by Jammu and Kashmir Board of School Education You can see the prescribed textbook on your screens we would be following this book during the course of our lesson though not elaborate yet this book addresses the needs of the students in a very concise and easy to understand manner first of all let's briefly know why we should study computers as a subject of study we all know that the era and times we live in is the era of computer science it is the era of technology computer science encourages critical thinking thereby helping students in understanding and solving a problem it makes the student think logically and analytically it has unlimited application areas today almost every sphere of work and every domain of knowledge is incomplete without the use of computers with the lightning paced developments in the field of computers and technology Computers are fast becoming an inseparable part of human life since computers are designed to solve problems it demands and enhances the creativity of students and above all in this age of computers and technology studying computer science takes the student one step closer to being a producer and one step away from being a mere consumer of technology The first unit of our syllabus has four chapters all aimed at educating the student about the fundamentals of computers. The first chapter as you can see on the screen deals with computer basics. The second one educates us about software concepts. The third one deals with operating systems which are extremely essential for the working of a computer. The fourth chapter deals with file system So coming to today's lesson we will try to cover the first chapter of the first unit today today we will study about the introduction to computers then we will touch the history of computers then the concepts of data and information would be explained afterwards the concept of hardware and software would be explained besides covering the components of a computer system and basic processes in a computer system We will finish this chapter with the classification of computers. I hope by now you would have gone through the PDF file which was given 2 days back for pre-reading purposes. By the end of the class inshallah the students would be made familiar with the history and evolution of computers. They would get to know the main components of a computer system and the classification of computers. So without further ado let's begin today's class computers the word itself has been in use till the 18th century for a person who would sit at a desk throughout the day and would do calculations however with the advent of machines and the precise and mistake proof calculations that they performed the use of the term computer gradually shifted to mean a machine a machine that would perform calculations the word computer is derived from the word compute which as you all know means to calculate you can read with me on your screens that a computer is an electronic device which can perform arithmetic logical operations and is capable of solving problems and manipulate data it accepts raw data from the user processes it and gives meaningful information that is a concise definition of computer you can notice on your screens that i have embolded in it few words in the last line the embolded in it words are accepts processes and gives these words are sufficient to get a general idea of what a computer does it accepts data processes it and gives back processed or meaningful information in the coming chapters all that we would be learning is how these are achieved 
For further introduction of a computer, you may want to check out the Wikipedia page about computers. It describes computers in details. A screen grab of the Wikipedia page about computers is given for your ready reference. You might want to pause the video and go through the first paragraph of the screen grab. With that said, let's now move on to the portion where we will cover the history of computers. We will cover only the major milestones in the field of computing. We will be limiting our talk to instruments devised for the purpose of calculations. Early humans used to use their fingers for calculations. The 10 fingers enabled them to count till 10 numbers and the 28 knuckles enabled them a further count of 28 numbers. Besides, humans also used sticks, bones, pebbles, etc. for keeping a count of numbers. Around 5000 BCE, the abacus was invented in China. Its use later spread throughout the ancient world. It was used to carry business transactions as well as mathematical, trigonometric and astronomical calculations. Centuries after the abacus, the first proper device used for performing calculation was the Napier spoon, which was invented in the year 1617. It was invented by John Napier, a Scottish mathematician, physicist and astronomer. He also discovered the logarithms. His machine was used to multiplicate and divide numbers. The 17th century saw quicker advancements in the field of calculations. Blaise Pascal, a French mathematician, physicist and inventor, invented the Pascaline, a machine that was able to add and subtract numbers. It performed multiplication and division by repeated addition and subtraction respectively. It efficiently and successfully devised a mechanism to perform carryover operations during addition. Pascal's machine was further improved with the invention of Leibniz's wheels in 1694. Leibniz, a German polymath, improved the Pascaline by incorporating Leibniz's wheels to make multiplication and division far more efficient. The father of computer Charles Babbage in the year 1821 designed the difference engine to carry automatic calculations and it could also tabulate polynomial functions. His machine could not be completed due to lack of funds. Charles Babbage with the help of Lady Ada Lovelace then worked on the design of a machine which he called the analytical machine. Lady Ada Lovelace is known as the world's first programmer. The analytical machine was supposed to be a successor of the difference engine. It was designed to be a general purpose computer and had all the basic requirements of the modern day computers. It included an ALU, a control flow and mechanism for storing and printing the output. Please go through the following video clip to further understand the importance of Charles Babbage and his machines. Charles Babbage was the only child of a tyrannical London banker, a bully at home. But his money kept his son and heir financially comfortable for life. Cambridge educated in mathematics and supremely self-possessed, Charles became an iconoclastic writer and habitual inventor. In 1832, the drawing room of his London home became a showcase for demonstrations of a small section of his difference engine a far from finished device by which he intended to revolutionize calculation by mechanizing it. At his soirees, London's intellectual society watched what you see now. As Babbage cranked its handle, this machine produced a series of polynomial calculations that were repeatable and error-free. Most astonishing, it was automatic. Any of his illustrious guests might have operated the handle as well as Charles Babbage, perhaps the geologist Charles Lyell, or Charles Darwin, or Charles Dickens. Once set, the machine seemed able to proceed to think on its own. But what was called the beautiful fragment of the machine Babbage had intended to build was all he ever finished of it. In fact, his imagination had already moved on to an even more ambitious mechanism, 
one that would make obsolete the abandoned machine. The analytical engine would be a general purpose calculating automaton. For most of 30 years, he would revise and improve his notional design. Only a few partial sections of it were built, this one after Babbage's death by his son. The analytical engine was an ever-evolving machine. Each breakthrough elegantly drawn up, annotated to describe mechanical motions with a coding system that Babbage claimed was his finest invention. The analytical engine may be the most intricate operating mechanism ever fully realized with paper and imagination alone. In 1846, Babbage abruptly changed course. As if determined to make good on an old obligation, he worked for two years to complete a full set of drawings for difference engine number two. It would require 8,000 parts, only a third as many as the first. He offered it to the government, but did not protest when it declined to build it, and the drawings were carefully put away. Eventually, they came from the Babbage estate to rest in the library of the Science Museum in London. More than 130 years later, in 1985, the museum's new curator of computing, Doran Swade, became convinced the institution could build difference engine number two. After all, with the intact drawings, it seemed feasible and within financial reach. It took 17 years and drama to rival Babbage's so long ago. And it works just as Babbage designed it. Every turn of the engine's driving handle is carried through gears, cams, rods, levers, and springs to release and arrest precisely aligned number wheels. A helical arrangement of steel fingers continually pulls the register towers to find and perform the carrying of tens. In its continuing sweep upward, it is mesmerizing. The intricate printing section can be programmed for one, two, or three column output, for two font sizes at once, for variable margins and column gaps, even word wrap where necessary. It prints hard copy on paper and simultaneously impresses the same output into a tray of plaster to produce a stereotype, a mold for casting a full page printing plate. When a tray is full, the printer pauses the entire machine. In the spring of 2008, a clone of DE2 commissioned by Nathan Meervold was completed at the Science Museum and shipped to California. At the Computer History Museum, it would charm new thousands of discerning eyes. Today, the crotchety proud genius, who never managed to prove it during his lifetime, has a fair claim to honor as a pioneer in the history of intelligent machines, just as his parlor guests in 1832 suggested. His difference engine continues to inspire the admiration of his intellectual heirs, a celebrated and unique icon to chroniclers of computing. Charles Babbage, remember, never saw it, except in his stubborn, prescient dreams. Let's now dwell briefly upon the generations of computers. As you can see on your screens, modern day computers can be classified into five generations with the first generation beginning in the year 1940 up to 1956. These computers were based on machine level language. These computers used vacuum tubes to perform calculations. The mechanics of vacuum tubes made the computers of first generation huge in size they used to be of the size of large rooms and generated a lot of heat. They needed air conditions to cool the computers. They had limited processing power and solved only one problem at a time. As input devices, these computers used punched cards and paper tapes. Two notable computers belonging to this generation were the Univac and Inaik machines. The Univac is the first ever commercial computer. It was used by the U.S. Census Bureau. 
The era of second generation of computers began in the year 1956 and lasted up to 1963. In this generation, the transistors replaced the vacuum tubes. They were a big improvement over the vacuum tubes. However, the heat generation remained almost same and required equal cooling. The introduction of transistors reduced the size of computers greatly. These computers used assembly language. These used to store instructions for later use. The initial versions of computers belonging to this generation were developed for the atomic energy industry. The third generation of computers began from the year 1964 and lasted up to 1971. Due to huge improvement in the arena of electronics, transistors were now made even smaller and fixed on silicon chips called integrated chips. This led to massive increase in speed and efficiency of computers. These computers were the first to use a keyboard for input and a monitor for output. These computers were able to run several applications at the same time. These computers were very cost effective and affordable to the general public. The fourth generation of computers began from the year 1972 and it lasts up to present time. The integrated chip technology was further made smaller and thus the concept of microprocessors gained ground. These microprocessors could accommodate thousands of integrated chips and thus made computers even smaller yet faster. The fifth generation of computers belong to the present era and goes further in the future. The computers belonging to this era are the smartest generations. They are capable of doing multiple and relevant tasks at the same time. These computers are based upon artificial intelligence and machine learning. Concepts such as virtual reality, voice recognition, face recognition, etc. blurs the line between virtual and the real world. These computers are being developed at a fast pace with the intention of making them smart enough to process and respond to natural languages and having the ability to learn and organize themselves. Now students, let's move on to what data and information mean. The word data is plural form of the word datum. It is any raw fact, in, it could be in the form of numbers, it could be in the form of characters, it could be in the form of symbols. Data by itself is meaningless. It may mean anything but given the context and processing, it transforms into meaningful information. When all required and relevant data are collected and processed, it gives us useful information. Processing of data to get information consists of various operations like arithmetic operations, comparisons, setting up of the data in order, etc. For this purpose, various hardwares are used which we will discuss in the later part of this class. Now let's discuss the physical components of a computer system. The physical components of a computer system are together called hardware. These are the tangible parts which we can touch, which can break, which could be repaired, which are which consists usually of electronic circuitry. It could mean your hard disk, it could mean the monitor, it could mean the CPU, it could mean the cables and all the peripheral devices, it could mean the printer, it could mean the keyboard. These are electronic as well as magnetic or mechanical devices. These can be classified into three categories, rather four categories. Input devices, output devices, central processing unit and memory devices. These four categories we will touch upon in this class. Input devices are those hardwares that are used to get data into the computer. The data going into the computer is called input. Depending upon the type of data, different types of input devices are used to feed data into the computer. These input devices provide data to the memory in binary form. 
Examples of input devices include keyboard, mouse, scanner, microphone, etc. Now let's discuss what is meant by output devices. These hardwares are used to get processed information from the computer. It is used by the user for getting information from the computer. The information that is got from the computer is called output. They get information from the memory in binary form but provides it to the user in the human readable form. Examples of output devices include monitors, printers, speakers, projectors, etc. It should be noted that the mobile screen of touch screen smartphones act as input devices as well as output devices. They get information in form of finger impressions, touches where they record the coordinates of the screen to get the required information of the user and they use the screen as a display, as a monitor or as an output device as well. Memory devices, these are hardwares that are used to store information or data in a computer. Data or information is stored in a computer in the forms of bits and bytes. A bit is the smallest unit of memory in a computer. It is denoted by 0 or 1. A set of 8 bit is called a byte. A set of 1024 bytes is called kilobyte. Likewise, 1024 kilobytes comes to be known as 1 megabyte. While 1024 megabytes is known as 1 gigabyte and 1024 gigabyte is known as terabyte. Memory in a computer is classified into two types. It could be classified as primary memory or secondary memory. Primary memory is also known as main memory or internal memory. It stores the data while it is being processed or is in use. It sends data and receives data at a very high speed it is directly accessible to the CPU without the use of input or output devices. Compared to secondary memory, it has smaller storage capacity and it is a bit expensive than secondary storage devices. There are two types of primary memory, RAM and ROM. RAM stands for random access memory while ROM stands for read-only memory. RAM is volatile in nature, it loses stored information in case of power failure. It stores data temporarily till it is under use. ROM is non-volatile in nature, it is a write, it works on the principle of write once, read many times. It stores small amount of crucial data required for proper functioning of the computer permanently. The data on ROM is written at the time of manufacture of the computer by the vendor. Secondary memory is also known as auxiliary memory or external memory. It stores data permanently. It sends and receives data at relatively low speeds. It accesses the CPU via input and output channels. Compared to primary memory, these have huge storage capacity. It is relatively much cheaper in comparison to primary memory. Now that was what hardwares are all about. Let's now briefly see what is meant by a software. Software is essential for functioning of a computer. It can be defined as a set of programs that make computer understand the user's requirement, functions to be performed and the desired output to be given. It can be classified into system softwares, application softwares and utility softwares. Some examples of softwares are Microsoft Windows 10, Microsoft Windows 7, Ubuntu, Microsoft Word, Microsoft PowerPoint, Excel, LibreOffice, Adobe Photoshop, etc. We will know more about softwares in the second chapter. Now let's move on to the essential components of a computer system which include input devices, CPU, output devices and memory devices. We have already talked about these devices. The input device receives instructions and data from the users 
and pass it on to the main memory so that the CPU could process it. This is done in binary form by the input device. The CPU processes data as per instruction and sends it to the output device. During the process of data, the CPU may also send and receive data to and from the memory devices as per need. On receipt of processed information from the CPU, the output device produces the output for the user in the required form. On receipt of processed information from the CPU, the output device produces the output for the user in the required form. Processing of data by CPU means arithmetic and logical operations on the data. The CPU also known as, known as the brain of computer is also responsible for executing all operations in a computer. Students, you can see the block diagram of a computer system on your screens. Right there on the left side is denoted the input devices from where the control flow is towards the CPU as well as the primary memory, which means the data from input devices moves into the CPU as well as the main memory. The CPU consists of three parts, the control unit, the arithmetic logical unit and CPU registers. The flow of data from the CPU is towards the output device as well as the primary memory. Direction of arrows denotes flow of data. Now let's end the chapter with classification of computers. On the basis of their processing power, computers can be classified into microcomputers, mini computers, mainframe computers, and supercomputers. Let's see what a microcomputer is. These are also known as personal computers and are designed for use by a single user. These are based on microchips, which are faster, smaller in size, and affordable. These constitute the smallest general purpose processing systems. These are used for personal use, small scale business, etc. Mini computers are more powerful computers and more expensive systems than the micro computers. They are used to serve multiple number of users. They are suitable for large businesses, colleges, etc. They are also used as web servers, email servers, etc. Mainframe computers, these are very fast processing computers that work on principle of distributed data processing systems. These systems support a large number of terminals. These are used in centralized computing system wherein terminals of different departments are connected to a central system. These could be used by remote users. These are mostly used in large corporations, banking, finance and healthcare institutions. Students. Terms like distributed data processing systems or centralized computer systems would be explained in following chapters. Computers having the highest processing powers are known as supercomputers. They are specifically designed to solve complex scientific problems. These are mostly used in weather prediction, complex molecular structural calculations, designing of supersonic aircrafts, etc. The processing power of supercomputers are measured in pentaflops. With this, we finish the first chapter of the first unit as per our syllabus for class 11th. I hope this class had been fruitful. Thank you. Stay home. Stay safe.